Okay, good afternoon, everyone. You're so Unix that your presentation looks like a terminal. Uh, well, I'm trying to be like you, Gabe. You, you were, I, I saw you uh, struggling with VS Code the other day, and oh. it was the funniest thing I've seen in quite some time. Um, you don't know the least of it. Like that was that was a dumpster fire. <laughs> Today, um, we're basically having a review lab on Unix systems programming, and so we're going to be spending this lab session to basically review a lot of those concepts and hopefully um, bring it back into your mental cache. But. Um, before we get started with that, I kind of want to just talk a little bit about some big picture Unix stuff. So you've likely heard the term Unix, definitely heard the term Linux, maybe you've heard the term POSIX. Um, so, so basically, I guess if, if I were to describe this, Unix is the original operating system. It was developed by AT&T Bell Labs starting in 1969. It got really popular in the 70s and 80s with the development of the internet. And then later on when open source became a thing, uh, Linux basically is an open source implementation of the Unix standard. And the Unix standard, which is basically a specification document that defines what Unix is, is POSIX. So you might have noticed that if you go into like Mac OS terminal, it's pretty similar to Linux, and that's because those similar behaviors are essentially defined in the in the POSIX standard. So that's that's basically the relationship here. Any questions or other thoughts about that? No? Okay. Um, so one of the the big things about Unix is the idea of the the Unix philosophy, and I grabbed the quote here. Um, Brian Kernig Kernigan and Rob Pike basically wrote this book, The Unix Programming Environment. Pretty good book. I definitely recommend it. It's a little bit dated. Um, but they described the Unix philosophy as the idea that the power of a system comes more from the relationship among programs than from the programs themselves. Many Unix programs do quite trivial things in isolation, but combined with other programs become general and useful tools. And so I've got an example of that. So in a little bit here, I'll generate our groups for, um, for lab, but I wrote an example here. So you can see that I, um, oh, I think I'm missing a character. I'm running uh, a number of Unix commands here. We've got cat, we've got sed, we've got shuffle, shuff, we've got awk. We've got another said because I couldn't quite get my awk command right. And I'm using the pipeline operator to basically feed the output of one command into another. And so when I take our names and put them in this roster file, I basically clean up any sort of weird spacing issues you have, shuffle the names, group them into groups of four, and then add a crown next to the first person in that group for the group leader. Um, and so that's that's basically the idea of the Unix philosophy here. So we have these simple programs like cat, set, awk, things like that. We're able to combine them together using IO redirection, such as the, the pipe operator here, and then combine that together to do pretty, pretty nifty things. So I wrote this in probably about 10 minutes or so. So you can generally save a lot of time just by getting really familiar with the command line. So that's, that's basically the heart of the Unix philosophy. And because, I mean, you look at these commands, like this is hard to read, right? It's pretty opaque. So the dark side here is this quote, if you have any trouble sounding condescending, find a Unix user to show you how it's done. So that's from Scott Adams, the Dilbert guy. And, um, you know, I mean, these commands are tough. And if, you, if you've gone on Stack Overflow and looked at any of the kind of exchanges for just people learning Unix for the first time, asking about some of these commands, people can be pretty terrible. So as much as possible, um, as, a, as a learning community, let's try to avoid that. So here's um, the major topics that we're going to be covering. And the way that this lab is essentially going to work is I'm going to talk through some high-level points about each of these. 
and then we're going to generate our groups and you're going to um, essentially do what we did in class and join the proper group voice and text channel and collaborate over REPL for those. So um, hopefully, hopefully we have kind of a good spread of people that were able to get REPL working. If you're not able to get the, the share feature working, just remember that there's that screen share as a fallback. So many of you have probably already taken a look, but this year the instructional team is devoting quite a bit of time to try to centralize resources into this particular repository, the resources repository. And thank you to all of our contributors here. If at any point in the semester you discover a resource you think is really useful and you want to share with others, please open up a pull request. We'd, we'd love to add that. Uh, so part of the lab today is you're essentially going to be stepping through and taking a look at what's inside of this repo because there's really a lot of good stuff here that's going to gonna help. Um, like, for example, I know a bunch of you said you feel uncomfortable with debugging, and so we have like a good GDB reference here for a lot of the main things. And then also um, specific things for setting it up with XV6 for later in the, end of the semester. You're also going to be taking a look at some of the kind of essential Ubuntu stuff. Um, uh, looking at the survey, uh, a number of folks bas basically said you felt kind of uncomfortable with some of the bash stuff here. I mean, maybe you're kind of thinking more advanced things since I showed that crazy pipeline. But I mean, for the most part, we're talking pretty simple stuff. So just being able to create a directory, go into a directory, create files. I'm, I can create just a shell script here. Had the proper permissions to be able to run this as a script. Stuff like that. Um, so I... In, in addition to that, probably one of the more uh, unfamiliar things you might not have done before is um, use aptitude, uh, which is the apt-get package stuff with Ubuntu. And it's, I mean, if you use brew or any sort of package manager before, it's pretty, pretty simple stuff here. So like, for example, like if I want to install a package, let's say I want to get cowsay. Installing this, and so cow say is a program where I can basically get a cow to say any number of things. So create a text file there, redirect the text in that file to my cow. All right, there we go. And one of the uh, kind of common Unix combinations is for folks to combine this with Fortune. Oop, that one's pretty long. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically Fortune just has a, has a bunch of quotes and things. Um, so one of the cool things about uh, CowSay is you can actually create custom cows. So if anyone wants to do something really cool, create a penny cow file. I'd really love to see that. And you can actually also create a custom database of Fortune quotes as well. Um, we also have a lab exercise for essentially practicing working with makefiles today. And makefiles really are glorified shell scripts in a lot of ways. The main difference is um, you define your shell scripts as rules, and they have relate these rules have relationships with each other. So this rule name here has a dependent job, and then it adds additional commands on top, and it forms essentially a directed acyclic graph. And 
make as a tool does does pretty nifty things like looking at when files were last edited to be able to determine if a rule has to be run again. And so that allows basically a way to prevent having to rerun GCC. And so you've probably seen that a little bit. Um, earlier this week, I was working on a make file for Kotlin, actually. And so here's this kind of a, a weirdo example for Kotlin and then running running my program using Java here. A couple of things just to point out. So these are essentially our variables I'm defining. And these resolve to text replacement here. So you can kind of imagine Kotlin C goes here. Homework2.kt goes here. All these different flags for JVM target and runtime go here. And it creates this jar. And then for run, this will actually rebuild my project there and then execute that on the JVM. So just kind of a non-C example. Um, but for the, the REPL it, we essentially have a puzzle here. So if we look at this make file, each of these different rules result in putting out a piece of text somehow. And so your goal is to figure out a way to come out with a string, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? And since this is like a super dated reference, click on this link if you want to see what the heck that actually means. So. Okay, so the next Repolit project you're going to be working on is practicing how to do testing in C. And the, the core construct that we use to be able to do testing in C is the assert header, assert.h. And that basically gives us a function here where we can evaluate an expression. And if it evaluates to false, it basically um, crashes out our program. And so by using that, we can create special functions that, that pose a particular input into a function, such as stack init here, assert that the, um, the output of that function or the, the state that that function manipulates occurs as expected. And that allows us to test particular inputs resulting in particular outputs. So this is just an example of a unit test. Um, and so in this, in this REPL, we have essentially a stack library that implements a particular data structure and all the different operations for acting on the stack, inserting initializing, deleting, pushing. And here in stacktest.c, we have a series of essentially unit tests that use assert to check that a particular condition runs. And so for this exercise, you're going to be extending this out to create new unit tests. And where you want to do that, I've marked implement me. And this is not really like a full set of unit tests for everything. So you might want to add additional unit tests as well based on this kind of um, pattern here. And this is, this is really what you're going to want to do for homeworks throughout this course, uh, because testing infrastructure like this is how we, we give you grades. And so there's really no way that you can be sure that your test actually meets the specification and that you're going to get a good grade unless you're trying to kind of do the testing that, that we do to assess your, your homeworks. And then um, I have an additional exercise to practice debugging. Uh, this is called a penny for your seg fault. And essentially I've um, created some problematic code with a, with a bug. And if I hit run here, it seg faults, which um, of course is usually pretty difficult to debug. And so I want you to basically run GDB on this. And I have some tips in here about things to try. And I want you to see if you can figure out the, the problem. 